through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and then the 2000s. Amen. We're going to have several speakers come up that are from each of those generations. Hallelujah. And they will share their how their generation relates to their apostolic identity. Amen. How the apostolic movement was throughout the years until we get to now. So as we commemorate our heritage, we also celebrate our future. Amen. We're pouring into the children. We're, we're, we're seeing how the apostolic movement through the years. Amen. Uh, and then one day, uh, like I said earlier, when we're dead and gone, uh, we've poured something into that next generation. Uh, that when the Holy Ghost is still moving, hallelujah, right. the same right. fire that started 2,000 years ago is still burning today. Amen. Amen. The same wind still blowing. Amen. The same anointing. The same fire. Yay. Hallelujah. Yes. And the only way it's going to move forward uh, is when we pour into our children, uh, is when we, we, we teach what we know, uh, and we, uh, we pour it back into that next generation. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and worship with them as they begin to worship and sing. Abandoned me. I thought y'all were going to stay up here. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Amen. It was 1953. My mother received the Holy Ghost in a revival meeting in the Assembly of God Church. And that opened the door for my family 
to become saved and to learn of this apostolic gospel. Amen. I was born in 1961, and the 60s were a time of racial upheaval, and segregation had become the norm in those days. And the Pentecostal church was kind of frowned upon in those days because we opened our doors to whosoever will. Amen. We did not uh, put a color on the Holy Ghost. It did not matter what color your skin was. The Holy Ghost was for everyone. Amen. We were known as the church that sat across the track. Amen. Anyone ever heard that phrase before? Amen. Most of our little churches were kind of run down, kind of beat up. Our hymn books had duct tape on them to keep them together. Amen. We did not have air conditioning. We had the windows propped open with a couple of hymn books stuck under it to hold it up. Amen. We did not have carpeting that we have today, except right down the middle aisle and across the front and up on the platform. And it was red carpet that symbolized the old rugged cross. Amen. I'm thankful for progression today, that this church has moved on. We are no longer considered the ones of Heresy, the ones that believe in heresy and teach heresy. Amen. We have become more accepted in our world. Amen. But let's not get caught up in the fact that we have become so accepted that we forget the true meaning of our message. Amen. Amen. Everybody must repent. Everybody must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Amen. And then you shall receive this gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord bless you today. There's a lighthouse on a There's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life's sea and when I'm tossed it sends out a light Thank you. 
A little nervous. Basically, I want to tell you guys kind of my story. Both of my parents, they drank and they smoked. And it seemed to be a normal situation. All our friends, all our family, they all did the same thing. And, you know, we didn't know the difference between, you know, doing that and not doing that and why it would be wrong so the thing that changed changed my life was when god god's plan for me was when he sent a church van in the middle of nowhere i was riding my bike the van showed up and they said would you like to go to church son I said, I don't know what that means. I never had an opportunity to go to church. So I started to go to church. My mother came to church. My sister came to church. I started singing in the choir at church. You know, and those people just brought me in. And I knew a different family. Like the family we have here. Special family here. Why someone would not want that, I do not understand. People come and go, and they don't stay. It it really bothers my heart because we love people here so much. I continued at the uh, going to the Baptist church many, many years, and uh, but I really attribute that van ministry to changing my life because I don't know if I would have got another opportunity. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. But that was my opportunity. And in my generation, I really believe that it was, um, the family was under attack during that generation. I'm sure it was in others, but I mean, Roe versus Wade, 1973. I was born in 73. My mother could have made another decision. God knew. Uh, You know, to uh, kill an unborn baby, my God. Also, the divorce rate was terrible. My parents were divorced. I was seven, eight years old. It was, you know, that was detrimental also. Um, Also, the generation I remember going to uh, when I was in high school, teen pregnancy, wasn't wasn't shunned people didn't look down on it as bad things were changing people were just you know just letting things go more and more and more so i was in and out of church for the next 30 years without finding the whole truth i did not have the whole truth i had part of the truth as pastor walked me through with apollos and said you have love for god You have knowledge, 
but you don't have the whole truth. I didn't want to hear that. I thought I had it. I thought I knew a lot. I didn't have the whole truth. As you know, my beautiful wife and lovely kids came to uh, apostolic faith before I did. I saw a change in my wife and children. I couldn't deny it. It was real. It was big. It was powerful. My generation really does not relate to holiness and truth. Our natural flesh wants to do other things, wants to be distracted. God's word says, you know, it's so easy to, to go against that. God wants us to be holy, to die daily. There's too many distractions. So as apostolic people, we really need to hold on to God's truth and his word. Keep our faith. And God and our family, <clears throat> now that I am an apostolic man, I would not settle for smoke. I got to have the fire of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Thank y'all very much. When he rolled up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the Ritz. Our God, God is an awesome God. His thunder and his footstep and lightning in his fists. Our God is an awesome God. Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. Return is very certain, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with grace. Sky with stars in the void of the night. Our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath He poured out on Sodom. Mercy and forgiveness He gave the separate cross. Hope, hope is not forgiven. That our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with me. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. It's going to be tough coming behind uh, Ken and Brother Strong. I'm sorry, Brother Coates and Brother Strong. Uh, so in the theme of being generational, good portion of my generation along with 90s and 2000s, a lot of us are considered millennials. So I do want to go over some safety procedures with millennials before I begin my message. Sister Christine has arranged for a safe space in the nursery with a very soft blanket. And a soy macchiato is available should you need it. So with that being said, I'm going to begin my message. So K 
key identifiers for people born in the 80s. So a large portion of our identity is shaped by 9-11 uh, and the global war on terror. In fact, for me, my freshman year, I, I was, happened to oversleep for school that day and uh, woke up to the news and seeing the planes crashing in the tower and then what uh, wound up being almost an endless conflict afterwards. Some of this group are, well, I've already covered that. Some of this group are considered millennials, depending on which definition you use. By most definitions, I was born in 87, so there's no uh, luck for me. I'm, I'm a millennial by everybody's definition. Okay, many of us made it through high school prior to the PC culture beginning in 2008. And so you can't turn on news, and depending on which channel you watch, somebody's getting offended. Uh, thankfully, I graduated in 2005, and I made it through high school without all the hashtags and different internet movements and shenanigans. So our generation, uh, as far as being children in middle school, had for the most part a bright, peaceful world ahead of us prior to 9-11. And then uh, what seems like hate-filled political climate that came afterwards. So just to give you some background on myself, I grew up outside of an, any church, not just apostolic church, any church, period. Um, I am a product of a divorce. Uh, no, no abuse or anything like that. It's just I had separate parents. One, one parent's on one side of the country, another on the other. So I grew up, for the most part, in California. Please don't judge me. Uh, our view of church and God. So growing up, we had a generally positive view of church, but had an apathetic experience with God unless you happened to be born into the faith. So once again, I, I don't, I, that was not my experience. We have been trained to question everything that can't be proven or seen, and uh, therefore fueling our apathy. Even when having brief periods of interest, there was just so many options. Where could I start? Um... So my experience of finding apostolic truth was this. I had moved uh, to Georgia supposedly to go to college. Uh, my, my generation, we went through high school with no trade schools or anything. You were told, you go to college or you're a failure is pretty much what it boiled down to. So moved to Georgia where most of my family is and was supposed to go to college. That didn't work out because I'm, I have very poor studying skills. And so I was in a situation where I was going to go either further into sin or I was going to find Jesus. And thankfully, I found Jesus. So what won me was is I came in contact with a group of young people. And the, the reason they had a profound effect on me is they became really close friends to me. And the cool thing about it was is it wasn't the fact that it, their friendship wasn't contingent based on me doing something in their church. You know, they... If, if I didn't do, you know, a, an event or whatever, they were totally okay with it. Hey, we'll, we'll see you next time, you know. But they were, they were genuine friends to me. And that's what I needed in my life at the time was friends. And thankfully, they were a positive influence and they were a godly influence. And so but because of that relationship, they had influence over me. And so when it came time for them to start sharing the truth with me, I was more receptive because they had already became my friends. And so I had to fight back my skepticism that I'd, I'd been uh, brought up with and trained to have. You know, what's, uh, you know, n any religion, but, you know, now we're talking about apostolic faith. We're talking about infilling the Holy Ghost and all these other things. I was like, uh, my mind was blown. I was like, what in the world is this? And thankfully, I liked him enough as friends. I was like, well, I'll just go along for the ride and we'll, we'll go eat, it, eat some burgers or something afterwards or, you know, whatever, and it'll be all cool. Well, they... They got the hook in my mouth and they said it, thankfully. So the point I want to make is traditional uh, outreach methods don't work on my generation. We, we have to have a relationship. And I, to be honest with you, I, I, I've, I've heard Brother Chandler mention this. Nobody has a front porch, and that's for a reason. Somebody comes up to your house and knocks on your door. You're thinking one of two groups, and to be honest with you, I don't, I don't really care to talk to them. So... And so they, they, through their influence and through their relationship with, with me, they won me to God. And that brought up a, a verse that I wanted to reference. Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, 
but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So I saw their light, and it did attract me. So, so though the apostolics became my friends, I got to see their substance. There was substance to their beliefs, and that did more than just sing, sing some songs on Sunday, then go eat some fried chicken. I soon discovered that the fried chicken was to replace all the calories burned during the apostolic way of worship. <laughs> my generation struggles with the spiritual side of our faith as well. Despite my best early efforts at praying through, there was that nagging voice in the back of my mind saying, nothing's going to happen. You're just talking into thin air, and, you know, you're, you're a nut job. That's what I was, you know, my skeptical side was telling me. But God knows each and every one of us, therefore he does things that we will probably not understand until later. I'd been seeking for the Holy Ghost a long time and was beginning to become frustrated. So the part of Georgia where I was living and the part where I, uh, you know, met my wife and got into church, uh, we have oyster roasts at New Year, or some of us do. And so we were having an oyster roast at uh, what was my future in-law's house. And I was, I was in the process of, uh, you know, being friends with the young adults and then chasing my wife, at the, who at the time was just a friend. And so when they, the elders there, they decided to start praying. They had kind of like an impromptu prayer meeting, and we could hear them in there. They were in there speaking in tongues. And then I felt like a nagging sensation to go pray. And so I'm glad that I did. I went inside and started praying by myself, and then... You, you know how us apostolics are. You see one start praying and crying. They, the, the rest of them are going to come. And so, which is a good thing because they helped me pray through and I received the Holy Ghost that night. And so even though my faith is challenged at times, you know, everybody has their, their points of weakness. I've never been able, even my deepest thoughts, been able to question that night because of what was so, the way it was so raw and the way it happened. I, I, if I was to deny that, I'd be lying to myself. There's no way I could deny it. And so I want to leave you for, with my generation's outlook. So for those of my generation who can withstand the dysfunction in our culture, I believe we'll do great things for God. We are flexible and adaptable in how we spread the truth. I believe we are not limited by past constraints because we are some of the people who rent an NFL dome to, ho to host an NAYC, making it a premier event in the UPCI. If you go and look at the senior leadership at the, U at the uh, headquarters youth department, a large chunk of them are 80 babies like myself. My generation has a gift for being socially aware because we are one by relationship. For example, if I get mediocre service at a restaurant, I will still leave a 15% tip and say thank you. Now, that's not because I'm a pushover. It's because they are a potential soul, and I don't want to throw away any chance I might have to win them or witness to them or share the truth with them. I don't ever want it to be a situation where I start talking to this person and I can't start a conversation because in the back of their mind thinking, you know, this, this lousy guy, he leaves me 25 cents on the table, and I worked my rear off just because I had a bad evening, you know. So I want, I want to be able to witness to them, no matter what. And you don't know who's, you, know, you never know who's looking at you. You never know who's watching you in public. Because we, we do get observed, and we do need to take that into account in how we interact with other people. Okay, so my generation needs strong, and one thing that we do need is strong men and women of God, like a pastor, who can lead us in biblical doctrine, but will also allow us to think outside the box. The cool thing about NAYC, I, I got to go with my wife and uh, the young people. The cool thing about NAYC, it was we rented out a NFL dome. It was a massive event, but there was nothing that was not doctrinally sound in what they did. It was exciting for the young people. It was something new. But the truth was still the same as when it got spread to Brother Strong way back in, was it, brother, was it 1930s? I, I'm, I'm, te I'm teasing. I'm teasing. So, but no, I, I have a great deal of respect for, for Brother Strong's generation. He, they, they were some of the, uh, without some of the things they've done, we wouldn't be where we're at today.
All right. Love you guys.
Okay, so I get to talk about the 90s babies. <laughs> Best generation ever, y'all. All right. Um, I'm blessed to say that I'm a part of this generation. The 90s are the generation that was born before the turn of the century when Jesus was supposed to return, uh, but he didn't. We are a generation full of young people who are trying to find our identity and seem to lack the knowledge of God. My generation gets a lot of flack for not having the same standards as previous generations or being obsessed. We're being obsessed with technology. However, there is a silver lining. Many of us are positive, forward-thinking people, and depending on which direction in life we take determines how we use those qualities. Fortunately, I was raised as apostolic, pretty much. I mean, in 07, my mom moved to Texas, and so I had an option. I could go the charismatic way or the apostolic way, and lucky for me, I got the Holy Ghost when I was like nine, so the Holy Ghost got me. So I was like, I'm going, Mom. Just, just I'm taking the Holy Ghost because that was just, it's a real experience, and when you have it, it's, you got it, and nothing else compares. So I'm sold out. And that's, it says, Proverbs 23, 22 through 23 says, Hearken unto your father that begot thee, and despise not thy mother, who, when she is old, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Important events, world events in my life, um, since, you know, all know that Jesus didn't come back in 2000, uh, the global war on terror has been going on through most of my life. Most of us get, got to vote for president in 2012. It was either Obama or some other guy. I voted for the some other guy. I don't even remember his name. He lost, but I voted for him. <laughs> most of our education revolves around standardized testing. I was from private school, so I didn't ever take tests. So I don't really know what that means. <laughs> Millennials, we're really not that bad. In fact, we're great. Uh, to answer that question, you need to see what kind of paths we take in life. Many of us, many of the people I went, went to school with, venture into the world with, without God, seeking to warn the world about global warming and its part in the natural disasters that are plaguing our world. They're passionate about free thinking, free speaking, being whatever you want to be no matter what you were born as, um, yet they want to silence every conservative that says, hey, there's a right and there's a wrong, and that's just not, that's not what they're going to take. Uh, for those like me who were born with, who have God in their lives, we venture out to spread the truth uh, to the world and warn them that this global warming isn't it, it's God. His coming is what's causing all these natural disasters. Now, those born in the 80s think that you shouldn't have Bible studies in Starbucks and, and where Wi-Fi is available, but I choose to have one in McDonald's and Chick-fil-A and anywhere at Chipotle. I'll go have Bible study anywhere there's Wi-Fi, okay? So, because that's just how we do things. <laughs> Uh, we are hungry to do our part in reaching the world, just as all of our elder saints have before us. Uh, do not underestimate our abilities, for we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Philippians 4.13. Looking at this world's obvious lack of direction ignites a fire in me and those that follow God, determining us we are going to spread the gospel and lead everyone we can to know him. 90s kids are the greatest group of kids this world has ever seen. For though we seem crazy and technology obsessed and just you don't know what we're thinking, but those spiritual giants you've seen before, they're in this generation coming up, us. We will be the next generation that does that. Thank you.
Uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to share uh, how I found God. Uh, so actually I was born into uh, Christianity because uh, my parents were going to a church in Beaumont and uh, well, we moved uh, to Austin area because my dad got a job at Central Market. So then we started to go to a uh, Baptist church in Rosenke, Texas, and uh, and uh, and then we we left that church because something happened. Uh, you know, <laughs> it wasn't good, and uh, <laughs> so uh, so then we were looking for a church. We were looking everywhere. We uh, we had heard some other churches in town, and we were looking for some other ones. But uh, Sister Pulaski talked to my mom through Facebook and told us about this church. So we came here one service, and uh, it was a Wednesday night, and uh, we sat on that row right there, the second one from the front. And I remember the, the first thing I noticed was that how loud it was. It was so loud. <laughs> I remember I had a headache, and it was, it was a bad headache. <laughs> and um, so then um, Sister Leanne McIntosh, she came to our house with a Bible study and it was the Water and Spirit Bible study, and uh, we did that. And I remember uh, it was a really good Bible study. And then uh, talked about uh, getting the Holy Ghost and why we need it. And um, and then Brother Shad, <laughs> I remember. <laughs> uh, I remember Brother Shad. He uh, he was uh, you know he was very. Uh, trying to push, and he was want, really want, wanting us to get the Holy Ghost, because we really needed it, you know, so, <laughs> but I remember, I thought it was, like, the craziest thing ever, so I remember, I told him, like, up straight one time, I just told him, no, I didn't want it, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and then I remember, because, uh, one service, it was a oh, months later, because, uh, because, you know, I told him, no, I didn't want it, but, um, I was over there, and then Brother Randy Hall said, if anybody wants the Holy Ghost to come up here, and uh, I said I wanted it. So I came up here, and I just started praying. I poured my heart out, and I got the Holy Ghost. It was amazing, and uh, it was the best feeling ever. So, and now here I am. <laughs> um, some key identifiers, or... The biggest one for my uh, my generation is technology. Like, um, I mean, I'm sure 95% of the people in this room have a phone, and about 70% of them are smartphones. So, yeah, <laughs> we love technology. And I mean, I personally do not have a phone, <laughs> but there's a um, a lot of people that do have phones in my generation. Thank you. <laughs> right? Um, so, um, my generation, um, we have a hunger for God. We're hungry. We're searching for stuff, you know, for anything we can find. But, and, um, like, I went to camp two years ago. And 16 people got filled with the Holy Ghost in five days camp. And uh, at youth rallies, we always there's always at least one person. Usually it's like three or four people at youth rallies. And NYC, I went last year, and over 100 people got the Holy Ghost. It was a whole bunch. It was awesome. And uh, thank you. told you you're not good enough when he told you you're not right when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight when he told you you're not worthy when he told you you're not loved 
when he told you you're not beautiful, that you'd never be enough. Fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear, he is a liar. He will rob your forever be alone when he told you you should run away that you'll never find a home when he told you you were dirty and you should be ashamed when he told you you could be the one that grace could never change oh fear he is a liar And one of y'all, I heard one of you say, well, I'm going to have to go behind him, and I don't know whether I can handle it. I just don't know whether I can handle going behind y'all. Praise God. Mike, it's good to have you in the house of the Lord. Give Mike a hand. Check us out, Mike. Check us out. I do believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. You mind me sharing a little bit? He said he's, a, he's bad this. He said, I'm looking for more, and I'm tired, and I need something from God. Yes, 
And I says, I were one of you. 40 years ago, I was a good old Baptist boy. And I was. I was a good old Baptist boy. I loved God. Don't take that away from me. I loved God with all my heart. In fact, I lived for God just as hard then as I do now. I'm serious. Now, I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't cuss my neighbor out. I lived a pretty good holy life. And I'd hear people talk dirty around me, and I didn't want to be a part of them. I was a good old Baptist boy. But you know what? I need the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost and fire. I needed something. It didn't take anything away. It did not take anything away of what I had. It just added something to. Praise God. Isn't God good to us? Uh, this, this was wonderful. All you speakers, the singers, y'all did a tremendous job. Give them a hand, would you? And Sister Heather, all of the ones that worked in the kitchen this morning, stand up, please, right now. All of the ones that helped Heather, you cooked, you got your hands dirty, and you got them clean. You did a fantastic job. Give them a good hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Church, this is not a one-man show. Pastor can't run this church. Pastor can't do all the cheap teaching. Pastor can't do all of nothing. I'm just a vessel. But sometimes the old vessel runs out. You've got to have another vessel on hand. And thank you so very much. And I don't want to take any more, uh, much more time, but I would like to say a few things. I'd like to, you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with such a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin that do, do easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that's set before us looking i love this part looking unto jesus the author and everybody say finisher he didn't stop in the middle baby the author and finisher of your faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of god i'd like to title this message generational blessings generational blessings not generational curses i believe that we can be an overcome comer of our curses and we are born the bible says with barn shaping in iniquity and we've got to overcome after birth whatever comes our path and whatever comes our way we are going to overcome every obstacle. I'm going to preach this church right into the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to preach you right into heaven. And I want to carry somebody with me. I'm not going to go empty-handed. I'm going to grab somebody. Come on, go to heaven with me. Somebody wants to go to heaven. I don't know what you're talking about, preacher. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm sick and tired of the mundane things of this world. Dry, dead churches. I'm ready for the fire. And when you're born in the fire, you'll never settle for smoke. Is this thing still on? Yeah, I got it. I, somebody, oh, now I hear it. Yeah. You can turn these down, these monocles. Mo monocles. Monitors just a little bit, please. Praise God. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, be with the church. Bring us into places we've never seen. Things that we have never seen and never heard of. Places we've never been to. God, I pray the blessings of God upon this church service today throughout. You may be seated in Jesus' name. What Satan has embezzled from the church, both individually and collectively, is reaching a point of recovery. He is plundering our joys. He is robbery of our victories. He has kidnapped our children who are caught up in the places of worldliness. And those things have got to stop and God can do it he has robbed us in war times he has hindered our prayers 
He has mocked our worship. He has looted our peace. But there's always another side of the story. There is always, always another chapter to write. I'm glad that it didn't stop in the middle. I'm glad when the Word of God says He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He does not stop in the middle. All of these things must be restored back to the church whose hope is not in another. One who is much higher, much more powerful than this world can ever offer. Notice the expressions, great cloud of witness, a large number of witnesses. There's two sides to this passage. First of all, a very attractive idea that has been witnesses with which believers are compassed with and spectators in heaven. I like that part. Saints in heaven who behold us down on the earth. There are grandmas. There are grandpas. There are aunts and uncles that are rooting for you, cheering for you to say you can make it. I made it. You can make it. Church, we're not alone. I believe that there's a one, a complete side. There is somebody, the spectators in the bleachers of heaven and says you can make it. There are those that are say the passage alludes to the famous Roman and Greek games. A big amphitheater. Down on the tracks below are the participants running the race. Up above them or surrounding them in great amphitheaters or maybe st stadiums. Rows and rows of spectators watching them as they cheer them on. It's a race of endurance. It's not a sprint race. I am going to hand the baton to the next generation. The 90s, the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, and now the 2000s. Church, I am believing that this year shall be the best year this church has ever seen. We have Olympics today. Olympics, they focus on sports. If he's a runner, his entire life is around and surrounded and thinking up on running. If he's an archer, his life is spent bettering himself, striving to hit the mark. If he's a wrestler, he will diet. He will exercise. He will practice until he's the best wrestler that anybody can see. If he's an athlete, he will get rid of anything that prevents him to reach his goal. He is focused. It is this kind of focus the Hebrews is talking about. Even the church <laughs> has a hall of fame. He said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and hell's not going to prevail against it. He's got hall of famers. Praise God. Bible quizzers. My wife has pumped me on that, and some of you are already pumped on Bible quizzing. You're going to hear about that later. Even our youth who stood tall. Shine brighter than ever. They will be remembered in the apostolic hall of fame. Bible quizzers will produce Bible quizzers. Every right choice makes it easier for those to come after you. Those seeds that are life fuller and your children, your grandchildren are better off. I want my relatives to do greater things in life, not because of me only, but the spite of me. I want to be a vessel. I want to tell somebody about this good gospel. There ain't nothing like it. 
There is nothing like this one God, apostolic Jesus name, Holy Ghost, tongue talking experience. Everybody needs it. And if you ever talked in tongues before you leave this service, you need to get up here. Let somebody lay hands on you. Go out of here with victory. I'm going to preach it until I go home. I'm going to preach it until I die. They're going to bury me knowing I'm a one God apostolic Jesus name man. If I would have been converted, I'd been converted by now. As much as I hang around the city. But they all know who I am. And they must know who you are. You can have I love my church all you want to written on your shirt. But honey, your life has got to amplify that. Your life has to say something that you really love. Your church. Uh, let's be a witness for that. Let's be a witness that I love my church. And not only the church, I love the God of the church. You're not looking at a half-filled-up preacher. You're not looking at half-mass, baby. I believe either all in or all out. Your life can become stepping stones instead of a stumbling block. Negative things get passed down, but God raises you up. And he puts a stop to all the negative. The generation curses. But I'm not talking about curses today. I'm talking about a God that's powerful enough. He, we can pray you out of those curses. We can pray curses off of you. You don't have to be a mandate of somebody else. You don't have to be, come on, you don't have to come. You don't have to have a pedigree. You don't have to look right, act right, smell right. You come and get God, everything else will fall in place. I like the Billy Graham, what he used to preach and teach. He said, come like you are. Just as I am, without one plea, church, I came to God needing him. I came to God because everything about my life was in shambles. I needed a Savior. You can store up mercies for yourself and also the future generations. God's raising you up to break the curse. Don't settle for things that are holding you back. Don't settle for those things. It's time that we draw a line in the sand and get on one side or the other. It's time not to be half mass. It's time to be faithful to the house of God. It's time to be faithful in all things. It's time to fall in love with the gospel. So me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You can put this scripture up there, 24, 15, Joshua. It seems evil unto you to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods of the Father serve thee, were on the other side of the flood, or the God of the Amorites, in whom land you dwell. But as for me and my house, me and my house, I will serve the Lord, and we will serve the Lord. The Old Testament talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Matthew 22, 32 says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of a dead God, but he's a God of the living. You know, I heard one, I heard one statement like this, whether it be a uh, commentator or whatever, and he said, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they said this, and I, I liked it. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was so different. 
it, all three of them were so different. And maybe God was saying, I'm the God of a difference, no matter who you are. You could come from a different culture. You could come from a different race. You could come from a different family. And guess what? I'm the God of all three. And I'm a God of all four. I'm a God whoever will or whosoever will. It doesn't matter what culture you come out of. It doesn't matter where you come from. He said, I'm the God of you. Also, a threefold card cannot be broken. Ecclesiastics 4.12 and one prevail against him. Two shall withstand him. But the three card is not quickly broken. When three in a row, that's a blessing multiplied. Let me tell you something today. You cannot hardly break bondages. You cannot break anything. But you get together, anything goes. You get two or three people gathered together and praying, hell is shaken. Oh, church, let me tell you something right now. God's going to answer prayer, but he loves collectively the body together, praying together, seeking the face of God together. And things happen. Hell shakes. It's not time to drop the ball. There's too much at stake. Your children, future generation depends upon you. You have the power to put an end to anything that holds you back. No enemy. No enemy is too powerful. The Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Don't you talk about me. Don't you talk about the church because you're a weapon. There's a weapon formed against you, honey, that you cannot fight. That's why I don't worry about my enemies. 38 years. Y'all listen to me. I've been living for God 38 years. I've been lying on. I've been talked about. If you look back 38 years and you look at some of their lives now, they should have wished to God they never said it or did it. Because my generation, I've lived long enough in this thing to look back. And you say, well, there's nothing, they ain't doing, God ain't doing nothing to them. Live long enough. Just live long enough. There's three people dead in the grave today because they come against me. My last church I pastored, and I mean they come hard against me. One killed in a car accident, burned to death behind the steering wheel. Do I, do I get excited about it? No, I don't get excited about it. But now people come against me. I said, please don't say nothing about me. Please don't. Don't say nothing about God. Don't, don't say nothing about the child of God. And it's not just a preacher. No weapon formed against you. Don't, don't talk about Ken Coates. Please, don't talk about him. Because there's a weapon that's formed against you if you talk about him. God wants unity. Isn't God good to us? Somebody's going to hold my hands up. And they get tired. There's somebody's going to hold my hands up. And guess what? You hold the pastor's hands up, and they get tired. You hold the pastor's wife's hands up, and they get tired. Can I tell you a good secret? You're going to win the battle because we're in this thing together. Yes. 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 Let me tell you something about me. I seek out, because I pastor, and I seek out people that are down and out, and I like to go to them, and I like to spiritually pick up their arms and their hands, because I know, listen to me, I know if they win the battle, that I raise their hands up, if they win the battle, anything connected in the body wins battles too. 
Moses may have had his hands up. There may have been a couple of them that pulled his hands up. Maybe two or three of them pulled his hands up. And you know what? The Bible says they won the battle. Who is they? It's not only Moses that wins the battle. It's everybody connected with Moses. Everybody that's following Moses, they all won the battle. Let's all stand our feet. Can we gather around this front just for a few minutes? There's some people in here that needs the Holy Ghost. There's some people in here that need the Holy Ghost. You need prayer. And because somebody's going to pray for you, there is nothing, no telling what's going to happen when you leave this place. I am convinced that every person in here, they didn't show up just because, oh, we're just going to play golf church today. They didn't show up numbskulled and say, well, I'm going to get my car. I'm just going to go to church. Yeah. No, they went to church because they wanted to come to the house of God. And you little darlings have been coming for a long time, and you just come under grudgery. I feel sorry for you. Don't get in that place. 38 years, I feel like a Caleb. Caleb says, I'm 85 years old. I started to sing when I was 40. I can remember back in Kate Ash Barney at 40 years old. It seemed like I lost some battles. But I'm looking at a mountain now at 85. 85 years old. I'm an old man. Don't know whether I got too many years left to live. But somehow, I'm stronger today than I was 40 years ago. 85. Stronger. Not in body. I'll tell you that right now. But in spirit, something inside of me is conquering some things that I wasn't conquering 40 years ago. Honey, let me tell you something. You newcomers, been here one year, two years, ten years. Hang on, baby. Because... You're going to look back one day and you'll say, oh, oh, I've won some battles. I got some battle scars. But thank God they're just scars. They're not open wounds anymore. Because I prayed through my bitterness. I prayed through my hard times. I prayed through my hard hardships, my hurts, my disappointments. I was lied on, cheated on, but I prayed through it. Now it's become wounds, has become scars. And really, Caleb was saying this. He said, my wounds that I had then have now become scars. I can't promise you that you're going to walk across that line one day. Scarless. You carry some scars to heaven. But you don't have to be wounded at the gates. Anytime you can give it to God. These altars right now are open. Oh, yes. I don't want to leave. I don't want you leaving here without being prayed for, sir. In the name of Jesus. God, by the Holy Ghost. Go ahead. All you have to do is say, God, I might not understand a lot, but God, I need the Holy Ghost. I need the power of God in my life. He called Lobo Sika Da La 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 La. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Come on, lay hands on this young lady. Lay hands on her. Pray for her. Name of Jesus. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, no, 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 no